it's hard to overstate how anomalous this is. Um, Sunday night, at both places, people are working on the machines. And it's like here, um, there's some stuff going on. Like you look down here, there's just some people whittling away, who knows what they're doing. Sunday night, around midnight basically, at both places, both teams without talking to each other are like, well, we're tired, let's go home. And so headed back in, they go through the control room like we have back here, and they sit down for probably like 20, 30 minutes, and they readjust the controls on the system to put it back into a mode where it's ready for observation. And then they go home. And probably before they even arrived at home, that signal came through Louisiana and then Washington. And what, what's the chances of that? They could easily have just worked for another half hour and then we wouldn't have had anything. It's not just that it was really anomalous that we found something in the first hour, but how strong it was. You know, we've now uh, looked at the data for the next several months, from then until j January. There's nothing in the data that loud. Can you tell me about how you first realized that LIGO may have detected gravitational waves? I think I was traveling on that day, so I didn't know. And I came back here, I believe, on, on the day after. And I was wandering around in the building and people were sort of whispering and looking over their shoulders about, you didn't want to spill it. So they were saying, did you hear, did you hear? Or have you seen it, what do you think? And I said, I don't even know what you're talking about. <laughs> and they said, yeah, it's like there's, a, there's an event, it looks really real. And I was like, whatever, I don't have time for this nonsense. I've got things to do, man. <laughs> <laughs> and Why weren't you more interested? Like this could be it, right? You've been working, what, like a decade to try to find this? Two decades? Two decades. Um, and you didn't want to say like, oh, I'll, I'll have a look at least. No. Um, we had just turned the detectors on barely and I, I was ready to wait for some months or six, I don't know. I, I could, we, we were gonna take data for three or four months and I thought, yeah, maybe in a month or two something, something will pop up but um, it'll be really tiny and we won't find it. And then we maybe will spend another six months combing through the data and developing algorithms to eventually find it. But, uh, you know, no way would it be like, whoop, you turn it on and, and immediately there's a signal, which is what people were saying. So I said, I said, look, just settle down a little bit. You, you don't understand how the world works. It's not like this. You turn on your device and there's some burps and glitches and it's a kind of, uh, growing pains at the beginning. And I said, when you've been around as long as I have, you'll understand how complicated it is, you young people. So just go back about your business and <laughs> nothing to see here. And that's all. And then it just wouldn't die. Everyone was still looking at it. And I just didn't bother to look at it for another week, probably. <laughs> because it just seemed like there's always fake events, right? And but, but how did you eventually convince yourself that it was real? Um, I downloaded the data and I looked at it and I pressed a lot of plots and then um, it, when I looked at it, it just seemed like, uh, you know, there's, there's no bells and whistles to it. The, it. It's two black holes which aren't spinning a lot and they merge together um, and it, it swoops up in frequency and chirps the right way and then when it merges, there's no, there's no craziness. It just kind of merges and goes Boop, and then it settles down and the final black hole is not spinning. It just seemed like something that you would just get, if you were trying to fake a signal, that seemed like a fine fake signal to make. And the peak frequency of that signal, there's a lot of astonishing things. The peak frequency of that signal happens to be at the frequency where our detector is the most sensitive. What's the chances that nature would engineer a signal right in our sweet spot, right? Um, the easiest thing to calculate is black hole, black hole, mergers because black holes are simple in the sense that they don't have a lot of stuff inside of them it's just a black hole in space and these two are about the same mass so the calculation of what the waveform should look like is really simple so it's the easiest thing to find in so many ways and i have always wanted to find a signal which was about this heavy because i thought wouldn't it be great to find a black hole that was heavier than what everybody else wanted and the signal would be really loud and if the universe made black holes this heavy, we could detect them way back in time to the beginning of the universe. And we'd be able to see, um, by looking at how thing, these things got distorted as the universe expanded, 
we could figure out a whole thing about how the universe expanded. This is before, so it's like, uh, it's just in my dreams. I thought, fantastic. And then when I see a signal like that, I say, like, oh, it's too good to be true. How could there be a signal that would be just like what I wanted? And as soon as we turn the thing on, that would mean that these black holes are so numerous that we're going to get these signals, you know, 100 or 1,000 times more frequently than we estimated. And how, you know, th that's not how the world works, right? It, it can't be everything's great. So I just didn't believe it. Mm. Uh, but then I went through, and with a lot of other people, we examined um, all of the different conspiracy theories that we had for how the signal could have been faked. Like, someone was mad and tried to do it. Someone hacked in and changed their software. Someone went in and pushed something, and they had someone else on the phone at the other site who pushed something in the same way <laughs> and uh, set up devices. But you see what kind of a mess it is here. Like, if I had a if I made a little gadget that made a little thing like that, I could probably hide it underneath some place and cover it with some aluminum foil or trash. And so we had people walk around physically with a flashlight and look around everywhere to look for hidden conspiracy devices that would be sneakily putting in fake signals. Because, you know, what if, what if it got to the point where like, we haven't had signals for so long and someone who's really been waiting a long time and whose Someone career really needs depends their on it. PhD or something. Yeah, right. Yeah. And th their career will be made by something like this. So they just get desperate and unethical, and then they spend a year building a really maniacal plan to somehow do this and, and evade everybody. And eventually we came to the conclusion that there was only maybe like five or six people left in our whole thousand person collaboration who had enough know-how to do all of these things. And so we all just stared at each other for a while and said, you know, did you do it? Did you do it? And we couldn't, we, we couldn't come up with any way that it could have been done, because you need at least two people to do it. One person alone wouldn't have been able to arrange it. And so I would say by two or three weeks after the detection, I was pretty well convinced that it was real. How did that feel? I was like a slow boil. Nothing dramatic. You didn't, you didn't go crazy and go to Vegas? And no, because it didn't happen all at once. Yeah, yeah. It was just each day I believed a little more. And each day I still had enough doubt that it was kind of keeping me settled. We don't even really know what are the ultimate limits of, of how small of a thing we can measure. And if you think about it, when you, when you, well, I say if you think about it, I say, what I meant to say is when I dream about this in the middle of the night, the way I imagine it is when you listen to a really uh, sublime piece of cello music, and if you're sitting close by, uh, you can hear all this stuff which nobody else can hear on recordings. You hear the breathing of the player, and then you, you hear things like the motion of the finger on the strings, and what's the roughness of the finger that's plucking the string, and um, depending on how the person holds the, the body of the cello, certain of the tones of the cello get damped by the person's flesh. That's akin to what we're doing here. So we're, we're slowly removing all of the noise which has to do with our terrestrial problems here, our vacuum equipment and the traffic and electrical storms and so on. We remove those things and what we found in September, roughly speaking, it sounds like a black hole. It seems like a black hole and it merged. But all of that richness that we could get, you know, what's going on? What's like the exact little shape and what's the scruff on the outside? And is it really like a black hole and what's going on? And is there anything inside of a black hole? And all of those details, which is the real, you know, the warmth of listening to really great music on a really good hi-fi, that's all still ahead of us. And that's what we're working toward here.